everybody. Welcome to another edition of Lab 207 Webcast. My name is Mr. Kite and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about Earth Systems. Topic for the day is going to be land management practices, so let me get you some objectives and we'll get going. By, this, by the end of this video, just one thing that I need you to know or be able to do, and that is to discuss the challenges inherent to the management of various types of public land. Today's video is going to be all about strategies used to manage public land in America. Um, some of the, like I said, some of the strategies that are used, but also the conflict that goes along and the difficulties um, that arise when trying to employ these strategies. So kind of keep that overarching goal in your brain as we go through today's video. So the first type of land that I want to talk about is rangeland. A large proportion of American land is rangeland. A rangeland technically is just dry open grass grassland that is used for grazing. Um, growing up in Colorado we had a ton of rangeland. It's just prairie areas that are too dry to grow crops on but are excellent for raising you know sheep, cattle, goats, things like that. So as I talk about rangeland management practices, keep the picture in your head of animals grazing out on a fairly dry prairie area. So the biggest problem with managing rangelands is the problem of overgrazing. And generally, uh, or at least until the 1930s, rangelands were treated as a commons. So remember we talked about the tragedy of commons the other day. Um, it was treated as a commons where everybody was allowed to graze as many animals as they possibly could. And obviously with that came overgrazing and the problems that we talked about associated with overgrazing being that you have very high levels of erosion from the wind and from water. Uh, you have got loss of soil. Also due to erosion you get compaction from too many animals on the land. You get polluted water areas from uh, animal defecation. You get eroded riverbanks from animals going up and down to the water. So there are a lot of problems that go along with overgrazing and with uh, the management of rangelands. Now, 1934, the Taylor Grazing Act was put into place, and the Taylor Grazing Act is basically a program that requires that uh, ranchers buy permits in order to graze their animals on publicly owned lands. The idea behind it was that if people have to buy permits, then they will put fewer animals on the land and they will uh, manage the land more responsibly. However, the price of the permits were set very low, so it didn't do a whole lot to mitigate the problem. And also, the price was set so low that the Bureau of Land Management, which manages America's rangelands, um, generally spends more money managing the land than it takes in as a result of permits, which obviously is a business problem. Um, so with rangelands, some of the problems that come along with that is you've got cheap permits, which I just talked about, meaning that people are easily able to buy permits to graze their animals on land, which can lead to overgrazing. Um, there's a lack of guidance. So you've got the Bureau of Land Management that is responsible for taking care of rangeland, but nobody really set out any goals to say, all right, this is what sustainable rangeland management looks like. This is what's okay in terms of water pollution. This is what's okay in terms of ground pollution. But there aren't any real rules, so the Bureau of Land Management is out there just trying to kind of figure out how to go forward, and my guess is that they're probably likely understaffed, and there are no environmental scientists involved in the management of um, rangelands, so you don't have the Bureau of Land Management consulting with environmental scientists to say how they can best use the land. So those are some of the problems inherent with managing rangelands. Next, I want to move on to talking about forests. Now, first thing, just kind of a fact that I want to put out there. In America, 73% of our commercial forests, those would be forests that are used for commercial timber production, are privately owned. So there is a portion of commercial logging that happens on America's public lands, but for the most part, it happens in uh, privately owned commercial forests. Now, talking about those public lands, some things that I want to talk about, and I want to talk about some strategies used for um, timber harvesting or the removal of trees from a forest. So the first strategy is clear cutting, and my guess is that in AP Environmental, this is one you'll probably hear the most about because it's the hardest on the land, but basically at its base level, clear cutting is just removing all trees in an area, going in with machines and chainsaws and everything, cutting everything down flat to the ground, that would be clear cutting. Now the reason that this is typically done is because it's fast and it's economical. You can just build a road in, take your machines, cut everything in sight, haul it all out. It's easy and it's fast. Um, areas that have been clear cut can be replanted, easily seeded, but some problems that go along with that is when you reseed those areas you can only put down trees that are tolerant of bright sunlight because there's nothing shading the area. So your trees that you plant have to be tolerant to bright sunlight. 
Also, it severely reduces biodiversity because usually uh, timber companies, when they replant an area, they're going to replant a single type of tree. And as we've talked about, animals have particular niches. You've got certain animals that are adapted to certain plants. So if you've only got one type of tree growing in an area, your biodiversity obviously on the plant end is going to be much lower. But if we remember the plants are connected to the animals, so if your plant diversity is much lower, that means that your animal diversity is going to be much lower also. Other problems associated with clear cutting would be increased erosion. We've talked about this a lot with, ero with uh, removal of vegetation, but something that we don't usually think about but is clearly associated with clear cutting is damage to aquatic ecosystems. Two things I want you to be aware of. Um, if you take all of the trees out of an area, you no longer have those trees shading the rivers and lakes, which means that the water temperatures go up. As the water temperatures go up, the chemistry of the water changes, and that can be extremely detrimental to that stream, lake, or pond because the animals that are in there are probably adapted to cooler temperatures, and now they're subjected to much warmer temperatures. Also, with clear cutting, the erosion that goes along with it, that silt and sediment that erodes off the land can wash into the streams, lakes, and rivers, highly polluting the water, um, adding a lot of pollution to the water. So a slightly better option is selective cutting. And selective cutting is going in and removing only the trees that are commercially valuable. So it would be cutting just small patches of trees or single trees and pulling them out. So obviously this helps to preserve the forest. Um, it does still decrease biodiversity because you are taking out probably one type of tree. Um, the trees that you replant into a forest that has been selectively cut need to be shade tolerant because you still have got trees around providing shade for the land. The biggest environmental damage that goes along with selective cutting would be logging roads and logging camps. So obviously you've got to get the trees in and out and you've got to get machinery and people in and out. So building those roads obviously is going to fragment habitats. It's going to take one habitat and divide it into two and uh, produce a barrier that animals probably may not cross over. It's going to compact all the soil that's in that road area. Obviously there's going to be erosion and then logging camps have got all the waste and trash that's associated with humans. So in response to this and trying to do forestry in the most sustainable way possible, um, there's ecologically sustainable forestry which is built on the idea of selective cutting. It limits machineries, even going so far as to use horses, mules, and animals to pull trees out rather than machinery. Problem is, it is very labor intensive and usually fairly expensive. So have those uh, types of forestry in your brain. Now, when we talk about forest management, some major things that you need to know about. 30% of global timber production is in the US and Canada, so that would be commercial timber production, but America and Canada have done a pretty good job of managing our forest where there have been relatively few forest loss and I've even seen maps and reports talking about the amount of forest cover in America has actually increased over recent history. Now one of the problems we do have is there are many tree plantations which we've talked about. If you're growing one type of tree your biodiversity is going to be very low which means that those areas are going to be prone to disease and insects and other environmental problems. Um, we've got the United States Forest Service, which is in charge of managing our forest land. Now, they're in a tough spot because on one hand, they are responsible for managing forests such that it is sustainable and keeps going, but it's considered to be multi-use land, which means that it is also available for commercials. So they've got to also balance the commercial interest. So U.S. Forest Service is kind of stuck on this fence between conservation and commercial use, and they often have to figure out what is the best way to manage the forest resources that they are in charge of. Now with forest, we always got to talk about forest fired because, I mean, they can be controversial. They're part of the natural cycle. A couple things you need to know, know about them is that they are part of the natural cycle. Now, anytime a forest fire happens, a couple of things that are beneficial happens. Um, first of all, excess brush is cleared away. As those plants are burned, the nutrients that are trapped in them are released back to the soil. Um, there are many species of plants that can only germinate and grow after they've been exposed to the heat of fire. So fire is something that is, you know, it's part of the natural cycle. But people often have a problem with fire because it looks bad. It looks like it's completely destroying a landscape. A lot of times people and our structures are in the way of fire. So, you know, there's the danger of loss of life and loss of property. So for quite a while, the Forest Service operated out of a mindset where they were going to try to suppress forest fires. They didn't want them to happen. People didn't want them to happen. Public didn't want them to happen. Problem with that is 
The suppression of fires allowed the buildup of brush, leading to more catastrophic fires when fires did actually occur. So the Forest Service started employing a practice of prescribed burns, which is setting small controlled fires to get rid of extra underbrush and also to cycle some of the nutrients. They've also moved towards a practice of letting naturally uh, lit fires, whether it's lit by lightning or whatever, burn while protecting uh, humans and our structures. So there's a lot of controversy usually about whether prescribed burns should be done or not, whether forest fires should be allowed to burn or not. So generally, forest fires are pretty good for ecosystems, not so good for the humans that live in the area. Forgive that rough transition. Next thing I want to talk about is national parks. Now, our national park system was founded on the principle of conservation. So these areas were set aside specifically with the goal of conservation in mind, and they are managed according to that idea of conservation. So they're generally off limits for logging and mining and things like that, but they do get damaged from outside sources. So if you've got development around the edges of the park, any waste or environmental damage that's caused by the development on the outside can creep into the park. Obviously, they're subject to air pollution because air flows in. Um, if, let's say, you've got a water source that has been polluted, it might flow through the park, causing damage. But really, the biggest damage to national parks is the fact that they're so popular. People like to see them. People like to hang out in them so they can be overused. And with humans comes waste and erosion and you know vandalism and other types of environmental damage. So as far as national parks are concerned, um, their popularity and overuse from humans is the biggest threat to them. Last type of management I want to talk about is wilderness areas. I've mentioned these guys before, um, but generally wilderness areas are off limits. They are roadless. Um, they are set aside for the maintenance of a habitat and the animals that are in it. Now, a couple of caveats on a wilderness area. Any roads that were in existence before the area was designated a wilderness area may remain. Also is the same for any commercial operations, whether that's mining or logging or whatever. If they were in place before it was designated a wilderness area, then they are allowed to stay there. And the last thing I want to talk about today is the NEPA law or the National Environmental Policy Act. And here is what this is about. It's about environmental preservation. Um, it requires that all federally funded projects, so all projects that are done using some sort of government money, must have an assessment done to determine their environmental impact. So if you're using government money to build or develop an area, you must assess the environmental impact of that development project. The way you do that is you complete an EIS, which is an Environmental Impact Survey, and this basically lies a, lays out all of the environmental impacts that can result from the project that you would like to uh, complete. And with that, oftentimes the government will require, all right, you will not be able to get federal money for this until you propose environmental mitigation. Now, environmental mitigation is basically putting a plan in place to uh, lower or mitigate the amount of environmental damage that you are going to do. Problem with NEPA is, is that developers are not required to make the most environmentally sustainable choice. So they can say, all right, here's the environmental damage that we are going to do. Here is a possible mitigation strategy, but we're not going to follow either of those because they're expensive or difficult or whatever else. So know that NEPA requires an environmental impact statement for federally funded projects, but the developers are not required to take the most environmentally sustainable route. And that's it. Sorry for grainy pictures and blackouts and all kinds of weird edits and things that happened in this video, but Make sure that you go through it and check out uh, strategies for land management here in America. We thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.